join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hello and welcome to Forum IES. Today is 12th April 2023 and these are all the articles that we are going to discuss today. Moving to the first article, it is about the Data Protection Bill. This bill is going to be introduced in the upcoming monsoon session which will happen in July. So, um, this assurance has been given by the central government in the Supreme Court and they have said that the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill is ready. So if this bill is passed, it will replace the Information Technology, Reasonable Security Practices and Procedures and Sensitive Personal Data or Information Rules. In essence, this DPDP bill will replace the IT rules. So, IT rules related to this, it will be superseded by the DPDP bill. Why this bill has been under discussion? Why this bill is even coming into force? When we already have the IT rules, it is because of the Puttaswami case through which privacy was recognized as a fundamental right. Since then, there was Sri Krishna committee. which was constituted and they gave their recommendations and as per their recommendations, the DPDP bill is being drafted and it is going to be introduced. So, this bill, uh, we have already discussed about this bill in editorial analysis, but now we will see it from prelims perspective. Okay. So, this bill, it is balancing between First thing is the right of the individuals and it also balances between the need to process the data. So, both are taken care of. So, say for example, we have the Aadhaar data. Alright. So, there is a right to privacy on one hand that my Aadhaar data should not be leaked. On another hand, using this Aadhaar data, I can be provided with subsidies for the my data needs to be processed. So, both these needs are there and they are being balanced through this bill. And this bill provides certain definitions. Firstly, it defines what is data. Data is information or facts or concepts, opinions or instructions. All these are considered as data and it should be in a manner suitable for communication, interpretation or processing. Anything that is used in communication which is capable of interpretation, which is capable of processing is called as data. So, this is the first definition. Next thing is the data fiduciary. So, data fiduciary collects the data. So, say for example, you are buying a SIM card. And you are providing your data to the cell phone company. In that case, the data fiduciary is the cell phone company. And they will determine what is the purpose for which they are collecting the data. And how are they going to process it. And by what means are they going to process it. That will be determined by the data fiduciary. The one who collects the data. And then data principle is the one whose data is collected. I am the data principal. You are a data principal. Right? It is, it is denoting the individual. Next is the data processor. The person or a body which processes the data on behalf of this data fiduciary. They are the data processor. These things are being defined in the bill. Alright? Moving on to the next article. It is about Punjab, the uh, Khalistan movement, some 
embers of this movement are brewing in the state of punjab and this comes under our syllabus in internal security that is why we are discussing this and the author uses this phrase beware the ides of march so this is a phrase that was used in the shakespeare play julius caesar so we all know julius caesar was assassinated so some time before his assassination a soothsayer that is one who predicts the future he says to caesar that beware the ides of march that beware something bad is going to happen that that's what this phrase denotes it's not relevant for exam uh, but in um, regulatory body exams or bank exams they can ask it in english section so it's a fun fact also that's why i discussed it moving on to the relevant part of this article why is this in article there is some kind of radicalist thread that is in punjab that is raising its head in the state of punjab so what happened first we need to know what happened why are we saying that there is a radicalist threat because of the emergence of a self styled sikh extremist preacher amrit pal singh so he was in news his apprehension arrest about that there was a lot of hue and cry and he has modeled himself on bhindran wale so bhindran wale he was the sikh extremist leader during the khalistan movement of the 80s so this amritpal singh he is modeling himself after bhindran wale and the, he seems to be galvanizing the fringe among the sikh youth so basically what he is doing is he is mobilizing he is mobilizing the fringe and he is also mobilizing resources from the sikh diaspora in australia canada uk us etc so he is getting manpower from among the extremist group among the sikh youth and he is getting money from the sikh diaspora that is the allegation that is leveled on him and bhindran wale was assassinated in the 80s itself there is a core group of bindran wale which is kind of operational they are not very active but it is seen that this core group of bindran wale they have connections with pro khalistan groups like six for justice babar khalsa khalistan liberation front this group is having connections so these groups are getting activated that is a cause of concern now all these things are happening in punjab and how should we interpret this generally it is being said by uh, the government and the ruling party that it is a foreign conspiracy it is a handiwork of pakistan's isi but we cannot just ignore this big thing as a handiwork of isi some kind of dissatisfaction some kind of dissent must already be there then only isi can make use of that kind of dissatisfaction so this is not just a emotional outburst of sikh extremist fringe it is more than that it has deeper reasons and the government of india the government of the state of punjab they have to go into the deeper underpinnings if we are not going to satisfy the needs if we are not going to identify the dissatisfaction and if we are not going to address it then threats develop if they are unheeded by the authority then only this dissatisfaction becomes a threat so we need to analyze what is there what is happening what kind of dissatisfaction is there so the drug mafia their links to pakistan it can be an immediate cause but the cause is much deeper we have to understand that cause so um, what might be the causes so first thing is the growing insecurity among a section of sikh youth 
so it can be regards to obtaining employment it can be regards to making a mark in life so this kind of insecurity is there second thing is from sikh peasantry we know that punjab is a green revolution state and now the benefits of green revolution are not that much we have attained saturation so there is a economic decline and that is also leading to radicalization and also the uh, threat posed to sikh religion uh, because of conversion to other religions such as christianity that is also causing a dissatisfaction in the state of punjab and amritpal singh he attempted to attack a police station he was crowned as varis punjab the all these things are happening and this is the intelligence that is arising and in 2021 there were farm law protests that were taking place right now uh, as per the farm law protests there needs to be investigation into where there other factors at play where was there any kind of radical elements which were also contributing to farm law protests that also needs to be investigated in the diaspora sik there is a revival of khalistan sentiment there is no doubt about it but we have to determine whether there is a sign of revival of khalistan sentiment within the country is there a dissatisfaction among the sik community in india and are they passionately advocating for khalistan these things needs to be investigated through intelligence inputs so we are seeing all these symptoms of radicalization and what needs to be done the way forward is that india needs to convince the rest of the world so uh, if we take the case of terrorism in kashmir so in terrorism india is very successful in conveying to global community about the terrorism in kashmir but in case of khalistan in case of this case india should effectively convince the rest of the groups we have intelligence exchange with countries like us uk so in that context it is easier to make our case in the global arena india should realistically portray the true nature of the radicalist khalistan threat so if india is successful in convincing the global community there might be sympathy for india's cause and there might be help from countries like us uk australia where there is outward display of khalistan sentiment so this needs to be a way forward we have to research we have to gather intelligence we have to do advocacy rather than resorting to hard measures so we have to first understand the true causes rather than undertaking hard measures right so this is about this article essentially the article says that there no needs to be intelligence there needs to be understanding of sentiments of sick people and lastly representation in global arena if we have to summarize this entire article these are the three points so it talks about intelligence gathering understanding of the sentiments and we have to articulate our threats in the global arena effectively so that is what is discussed in this article moving on to the next article it is about preventive detention preventive all right so why this is in news because supreme court has opined that preventive detention laws are colonial legacy and it confers arbitrary power on the state 
so this particular preventive detention laws are a threat to personal liberty and it has been once again reiterated by the supreme court so before we come to the analysis part let us first see what is preventive detention from prelims perspective this is very very important for prelims okay now we will have a brief overview of article 22 clause b which provides protection against arrest and detention and this particular right is available for both citizens as well as aliens and preventive detention cannot exceed 3 months and if we have to exceed it more than 3 months and then it should be according to the advice of an advisory board and this advisory board must comprise of judges of a high court whenever a person is detained under any preventive detention law the grounds for detention must be communicated to the person if this grounds are against public interest then it need not be disclosed otherwise the grounds of detention must be communicated to the detainee and they should be given an opportunity to make representation against the detention and the article also says that parliament will make laws under what circumstances a person can be detained for more than 3 months without obtaining the opinion of an advisory board generally if they have to be detained after more than 3 months the opinion of an advisory board must be there but parliament can make a law prescribing which circumstances a person can be detained more than 3 months without obtaining the opinion of the advisory board and what can be the maximum period of detention under any case and what procedure needs to be followed by the advisory board all these things can be prescribed by a law made by parliament and preventive detention laws are there so these laws can be made by parliament as well as state legislature parliament can make preventive detention laws for defense foreign affairs security of india security of a state maintenance of public order maintenance of supplies and services for all these grounds the parliament can make preventive detention laws state legislature can also make preventive detention law but it can be only for security of a state maintenance of public order maintenance of supply and services so these aspects are common subjects for both parliament and state legislature it means that on these subjects both the parliament as well as state legislature can make preventive detention law okay now coming to the analysis part so what happens is we already saw whenever a person is being detained the grounds of detention has to be communicated right but many a times there is a failure to adhere to procedural safeguards the procedural safeguards how a detainee should be held they uh, how they should be communicated the grounds of detention how they must be allowed to make representation against this detention these are all the procedural safeguards but practically if we see there are multiple evidences saying that procedural safeguards are not properly followed and many a times detention orders are set aside but even if this detention orders are set aside it is not of any use to the person who is detained because it this kind of detention orders being set aside happens months after their detention the case will be going on for months or uh, even after the expiry of detention then the court will rule that this detention is illegal so ultimately there is a redundancy in this case we are able to see that they will be languishing in jail and after they get uh, out of jail after they get out of the pre preventive detention if the court is setting aside and if the court is saying that this preventive detention was illegal what is the purpose of that anyway the person is not going to be benefited right and 
um many at times there is failure to provide proper grounds for detention these are all the procedural safeguards we already told that they are not being followed properly actually the preventive detention laws must be to apprehend the habitual offenders instead of that suspects are detained many at times political rivals are detained right so this preventive detention laws are being misused that is what is being conveyed in this editorial analysis okay moving on to the next article it is saying that the present lok sabha that is 17th lok sabha it is likely to be the shortest since 1952 now observe this first chart so this is talking about number of sittings for each lok sabha if you see the 17th lok sabha it might amount to only 230 sittings which is the lowest if you see for full term so here there are very low sittings but they didn't complete five year term but 17th lok sabha will be completing its five year term and in a full term lok sabha this is the lowest number of sittings then this chart is important number of bills passed by lok sabha so if we see after the 13th lok sabha the bills passed by the lok sabha are steadily declining this might be asked in mcq questions next chart time spent on budget discussion if you see in 2023 only 16 hours are spent on budget discussion that is a worrying trend number of debates here they are talking about adjournment motion short duration discussion half an hour discussion etc so if we see the adjournment motion it has remained steady over time but the debates that is uh, short duration discussion half an hour discussion they are all steadily declining next chart is talking about share of question hour so if we see as total amount of time that is uh, happening in a sitting and its ratio to question hour c the question hour is very very minuscule so this is a worrying trend for our democracy but from prelims point of view we have to talk about these things that is first thing is motion of thanks why there is a motion of thanks because first session after every general election and first session after every fiscal year it is addressed by the president and this address will be discussed in both the houses of parliament on a motion called as motion of thanks they'll address uh, they will discuss the contents of this presidential address and at the end of this discussion a motion must be passed and that motion is called as motion of thanks and this has to be passed this has to be passed in lok sabha and if it is not passed in lok sabha then it means that there is defeat of government okay that is our motion of thanks next thing is about half an hour discussion so half an hour discussion it is to discuss a matter of public importance which has already been discussed and it is just a elucidation on a matter of fact generally the speaker allots 3 days in a week 3 days in a week is allotted generally for half an hour discussion and at the end of this discussion there is no motion or voting and it is a it is just a revival of a discussion that has already taken place and there needs to be some clarification of fact that is half an hour discussion next one is short duration discussion it is also called two hour discussion and the speaker can speaker can allot two days per week for this short duration discussion and it should be on a matter of urgent public importance again like half an hour discussion in short duration discussion also there is no motion or voting most important is the adjournment motion so this is also used to call attention to a definite matter of urgent public importance for this motion to be admitted itself there should be support of 50 members why because it interrupts the normal business of the house so it is an extraordinary device that is why it needs the support of 50 members to be admitted even 
and it has a element of censure against the government you are interrupting the normal business and you are discussing a matter of urgent public importance so obviously it is a criticism against the government so it takes place only in lok sabha and not in rajya sabha and this discussion so if it is an extraordinary device it should not be for a short duration minimum 22.5 hours that means the discussion should happen for more than 2.5 hours so that much important matter can only be discussed in the adjournment motion and under what circumstances an adjournment motion cannot be admitted so for an adjournment motion to be admitted the matter should be definite it should be factual it should be urgent and it it should be of public importance and it should not cover more than one matter only one matter can come under a adjournment motion and it should be a specific matter and it should be a recent occurrence it should not raise a question of privilege for that we have privilege motion so it should not come under adjournment motion all right and it should not deal with sub judice that is something that is already in court that should not be talked about in an adjournment motion and it should not revive a discussion we already saw half an hour discussion revives a discussion so it should not revive adjournment motion should not revive a discussion and it should not raise a question that can be raised on a distinct motion so it is a very extraordinary thing that we should keep in mind so it should be for something that is substantial not for some uh, silly things okay so that is why there are a lot of conditions with respect to adjournment motion then we have to talk about question hour so we saw in this graph right it talked about question hour the share of question hour is decreasing so what is this question hour question hour so for every sitting morning 11 am the house will sit so the first hour that is 11 am to 12 noon is the question hour so in the question hour the members the mps will ask question to minister and minister should answer those question so it should it is a device that holds the government accountable so it is for accountability of the government and there are three kinds of question that is starred question unstarred question and a short notice question so a starred question is distinguished by an asterisk and for a starred question oral answer is given in the floor of the house so obviously the member will also be present the minister will also be present then the member can ask supplementary question that is follow up question unstarred question it requires a written answer so it is provided in writing it is not on the floor of the house so a supplementary question cannot follow short notice question so for this a notice is given for of less than 10 days less than 10 days means it is a short notice question and it is also answered orally apart from minister question can also be asked to private member under what circumstance if it is a private member bill uh, if it is a bill introduced by that private member it is concerning a business of the house for which that member is responsible so question can be directed at ministers and it can also be directed at private members that is about question number that's it about this article we'll move to the next article it is about technical textiles ministry of textiles they have unveiled quality control order for technical textile items uh, for 19 geo textile and 12 protective textile i'll explain what are this in the next slide so this is the first technical regulation in the country for technical textiles and what are they said there should be mandatory bis marking bis is bureau of indian standards that is bis 
there should be mandatory bis marking and uh, from this notification issue date within 180 days of issue the technical uh, textiles should have a bis marking now what is technical textile it is a functional fabric it's not something we wear every day that is textile technical textiles are functional fabrics they have application across various industries say for example here they have shown protective gear right so this is a technical textile especially this is the protective textile okay so they have some kind of utility they are not the everyday clothes that we wear okay so there are 12 technical textile segments that is agrotech meditech even bandages uh, the mass they are all meditech they are also technical textiles build tech mobile tech the seat belts and all they come under mobile tech cloth tech oiko tech geo tech pack tech home tech pro tech indu tech and sport tech so geo tech is to hold uh, the soil to prevent the soil erosion and pro tech is to make protective gears for this geo tech and pro tech only the uh, ministry of textiles they have come up with the quality control order and regarding this there is a national technical textiles mission this is very important it might be asked in this prelims so why this mission has come up to make india a global leader in technical textiles and also to increase the use of technical textiles in the domestic market the aim of this mission is also to increase the market size from 40 billion usd to 50 billion usd and this is for 4 years starting from 2020 to 2021 and there are four components the first component is r&d second is market development third is export promotion fourth is training and skill development these are all the four components of national technical textile mission that's it for today's discussion we will see some previous year question so this is also from 2019 prelims global competitiveness report is published by a international monetary fund that is imf b united nation conference on trade and development c world economic forum d world bank answer is world economic forum w e f they publish the global competitiveness report next with reference to swadeshi movement consider the following statements it contributed to the revival of the indigenous artisan crafts and industries two the national council of education was established as a part of swadeshi movement so swadeshi movement happened in 1905 and it is a response to partition of bengal right so it is to promote swadeshi items so which means it will lead to the revival of indigenous arts and crafts so first statement is correct swadeshi it also led to nationalization of education so national council of education was also established during this movement so answer is c both 1 and 2 next question which one of the following is not a harappan site not a chanudaro b kot dg c sogaura d desalpur so answer is c sogaura chanudaro kot dg desalpur they are all harappan sites desalpur is in gujarat kot dg is in pakistan chanudaro is also in pakistan Sogora is in UP, but it is not a Harappan site. Okay, so that's it for today's discussion. Thank you. All the best. This is Indumati signing off. Follow us on all these social media platforms.